This week on The Anxious Truth, we're talking about what happens when an anxious person loses the ability to trust their own body. So let's get at it right now. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast that covers all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and anxiety recovery. This is episode 304. We are recording in November of 2024, in case you are listening in the future. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. I am a therapist practicing under supervision as of November 2024 in the state of New York, specializing in the treatment of anxiety and anxiety disorders. I am a three-time author on this topic, a social media guy, an advocate, an educator, and unfortunately, a former sufferer of things like panic disorder, agoraphobia, OCD, and depression for many years of my life on and off, but doing better now. Thank you very much. If this is your first time here, welcome. I hope you find things useful in this episode and maybe others if you check it out. Of course, if you are a returning listener or viewer on YouTube. And by the way, if you're viewing on YouTube this week, I'm sorry, because you're not viewing on YouTube this week. There's no video, just a still image. But if this, if you are a returning viewer or listener, welcome back. I hope you find this episode helpful, and thank you for spending time with me again and supporting the work that I do. So today we are going to talk about how an anxious person, who, who I would define as somebody who is dealing with chronic or disordered states of anxiety, how that person can over time not only learn to fear their own body, but can no longer trust their own body. And if you're listening to this and your anxiety presents predominantly in physical ways, and that is your focus on the physical sensations of anxiety, then you probably get what I'm talking about. For anxious people who are struggling for any extended period of time, not only do they become afraid of their own body, but they also lose the ability to trust in their own bodies. That's a tough place to be. So we're going to talk about that today. A quick disclaimer before we get started. We are always assuming here on this podcast or in any of the social media content that I create that you have been checked out and medically cleared. You have a medical care team or provider that is not just suggested, but it's actually required. If you were my therapy client, which you are not, I mean, I guess, except for that tiny group of you that are clients and also listening to this podcast, I would not engage in things like exposure planning or work on any physical activity with you until you had that medical review. So if you are too afraid to get checked out, which is common in this community, you're gonna have to work on that. And I get it. But you might want to stop listening to this podcast episode right here because I could not give you advice on doing physical type exposures until you have that medical clearance. So that being said, let's sort of get into this. This is a discussion about how chronic and disordered anxiety can leave the person struggling, fearing and no longer trusting their body. But one more thing before we get into the meat of it. Uh, as you are aware, if you listen on a regular basis, The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode. There's a bunch of other goodies on my website at theanxioustruth.com, including links to all 300 and somewhat prior podcast episodes, the books I've written, low-cost workshops and programs, uh, all my other social media channels and content. Go check it out. The website is theanxioustruth.com. So avail yourself of all the goodies, most of which are free, all of which are low-cost. So chronic pain, if we look at this through the lens of like somebody who's dealing with chronic pain or chronic illness, those sort of things can lead to functional degradation, right? Which means that a person who has a chronic illness or is dealing with chronic pain that may be hard to manage or get rid of is going to wind up finding their, their function impacted in some negative way. And for those folks, their life starts to get restricted. They have to have accommodations. They have to sort of work around the injuries or the pain or the illnesses. And that can lead them to be frustrated and to have to kind of change the way they operate. And they also may no longer trust in their own body, right? That is really common for people who are dealing with chronic illness or chronic pain or injuries that are slow to heal. They might find themselves sitting and lamenting the fact that they cannot do what they want to do or used to be able to do physically. Now, in that context, and if, and if that is you, by the way, if you are in an overlap where you're dealing with that and also dealing with an anxiety disorder and listening to this podcast, my heart goes out to you. It's a very difficult place to be for sure. So if this is what happens, we can look at it as one version of what we're talking about today, because there is legitimately a medical or physical impairment there. There is physiology under the hood that is in fact calling, causing an actual impairment that requires working around or accommodating. And yes, that person may decide I cannot any longer trust my body like I used to because there's something physically or medically going on there. 
Unfortunately, this happens to many, many people. And again, some of you are members of the audience listening to this podcast. So hang in there and do the best you can if that is you. But for somebody who is struggling with chronic or disordered anxiety, we're always talking about the context where you are generally anxious because you are anxious, you are afraid because you are afraid, then the and the primary concern of that is you and the primary concern for you is the physical sensations of anxiety, the same thing can and often does happen. Unfortunately, this person has no physiological problem, no chronic illness, no long healing injury, no chronic pain, but they also begin to start to treat themselves as fragile or broken or physically incapable. An anxious person might actually treat themselves as if they are always in some kind of medical danger. This is incredibly common. And I would think in the community surrounding this podcast and the other work that I do, we're probably split about 50-50. Some people are really focused on the physical aspects of anxiety, and some people are focused on the mental or thought aspects. It is incredibly common if you are finding yourself in a place where anxiety symptoms themselves are causing you to treat yourself like you have a medical problem that doesn't exist, or that you're in some sort of medical danger that doesn't necessarily exist, or that you're like physically incapable or fragile. This then leads to restricting your lifestyle and your activities. So I hear statements like, I can't bend over to tie my shoe. Because if I do that, I might get a little lightheaded. And I'm terrified of that feeling. I can't walk too far or my heart might start beating quickly. And that freaks me out. It makes me panic. I can't play with my kids because I might feel out of breath. And if I feel out of breath, then I start to panic and I get really anxious and my day is ruined. Or I can't drive anymore because I might feel that sort of visual off balance on a boat kind of thing that terrifies me and I don't want to feel that. So if you see the way these restrictions in lifestyle start to play out, it can really start to look exactly like a problem faced by a non anxious person that's dealing with an actual injury or an illness or a chronic, chronic medical condition of some kind. So what's the difference? I mean, functionally, you might look at those two people and not be able to tell them apart. Functionally, it looks pretty much the same. But the sick or injured or chronically ill or chronic pain person is actually impaired. There is a physiological deficit of some kind that was caused by an injury or an illness or something like that. Whereas the anxious person sees normal bodily functions as indicative of a impairment or a possible impairment. See the difference there? If you look at somebody who's struggling with a chronic illness or chronic pain or a long healing injury and an anxious person who's become terrified of their own body and restricts themselves accordingly, they would look the same on the outside. But the motivation is different on the inside. The anxious person sees a normally functioning body as indicative of impairment or possible impairment or even danger or fragility. And in the end, the person struggling with chronic or disordered anxiety begins to not only fear their own body, which if you're listening, you can probably relate to, I used to fear my own body in a huge way. This is a, one of the hallmarks of many anxiety disorder presentation. But that person also begins to lose trust and faith in their body. And this is a thing we hear all the time. This is hugely impactful. Because as it turns out, we live in a physical world, we are physical beings where use of our bodies is what moves us through time and space, we use our bodies for everything. So if you've reached the point where you are too afraid of your body, or you feel that you can't trust your body any longer, life gets really difficult which adds to the emotional and psychological burden of the disordered state as if it wasn't difficult enough as it is. So here are some common statements that we would hear in our community. People will say things like, I feel like I can't trust my body anymore. Or I used to be an athlete, and now I don't even know who I am anymore. Or they might say something like I used to enjoy hiking and outdoor activities with my family and my friends. And I've lost that huge part of my life. Or people will often say, I feel like my body has failed me or is betraying me. And, and those are tough to hear. Those are heartbreaking statements, right? I mean, clearly, my heart goes out to anybody who finds themselves in this situation. And I remember feeling that way. It's very, very difficult. The anxious person that has lost trust in their own body often feels even more lost and hopeless than ever. And they may start to see no way out of the predicament because if my body fails or they see it as failing, then what am I left with, right? Because we live in a physical world. Now, as a quick side note, this is not what this episode is about, but I think it leads to an important topic. When we frame it through this lens, you could see why people start to overuse the phrase anxiety and depression are two sides of the same coin, 
or why people will often make blanket statements about how depression, anxiety always come together. But in this context, when we look through this lens, can you see how the depressed state can actually be a direct result of the anxious state? So for instance, if somebody is in a depressed state after the loss of a loved one, we would not see them as psychologically flawed or damaged in some way. But an anxious person that feels depressed because they're forced to live a very limited life will often see themselves exactly that way as broken or flawed or, or in need of healing in some way. They'll look as if they have two mental illnesses. Now, in my experience, which may or may not apply in your actual life, you have to decide that anxious people are primarily feeling depressed or having depressed states and moods because they are anxious and restricted as a result, right? Very different situation, right? Just wanted to mention that because that feeling that your body is betraying you can be very difficult emotionally, and it can lead to feeling low or sad or depressed at times, situational in nature, at least the way I kind of look at it. So after that little shortcut, let's go back to the topic. The logical question that you might be asking now is like, yeah, Drew, this is how I feel. I feel like my body has failed me. I feel like my body, my body is betraying me. I can't control it anymore. I can't trust it. And I'm treating myself like I'm made of glass all the time. So how do I learn to trust my body again and or sort of not feel it? Well, when we're following the principles of recovery that align with current acceptance and mindfulness-based forms of third-wave cognitive and behavioral therapies, and that is my jam, that's where I'm always coming from, always going to keep that in mind, we have a few paths available to us. But here's a spoiler alert, none of those creates sort of air quotes body trust just through thinking. There's no such thing that I'm aware of where you could just decide to trust your body again or feel like you trust it thinking, cognitive restructuring, talking about it, affirmation, cell talk, rarely if ever gets that job done. In fact, I'm almost going to say never, I have not seen anybody overcome this problem just through positive self talk. For instance, it's experience doing things that you are sure you should not do is always part of this puzzle. So just keep that in mind, as we kind of go on to sort of the second half of the episode, right? So if you've been around here long enough, you know that I talk all the time about exposure. And exposure is just what we call it when someone intentionally and willfully chooses to face the thing they fear without resorting to avoidance or control-based coping strategies. And they do that to learn that they are capable of handling the fear. For an anxious person in our context, the exposure is the anxiety itself. In the context of this particular episode or video, we care most about the physical symptoms of anxiety and fear. When doing exposures, which means choosing to be triggered, the physical sensations you see as dangerous or signs that your body is failing are part of what you are trying to learn to work through as opposed to run away from to learn that the sensations are natural responses to the threat response and not indications of medical emergency or physiological deficit or malfunction in some way. That's important, right? So when we have those exposures experiences and we work through the racing heart, the jelly legs, the dizzy feeling, the shortness of breath, and come out the other side without saving yourselves, we begin to recognize that like, oh, this is really uncomfortable. I don't like when this happens, but I, I, I can stop treating it like a medical emergency or stop treating myself like I'm about to break. Now, here is where we can get really specific about exposures and use what we call interoceptive exposures. These are sort of mini exposures that are specifically targeting the physical sensations of anxiety and fear, the things you, you experience in your body. An interoceptive exposure, your therapist, you're always doing it with a therapist, right, or a qualified person, your therapist might invite you to do some light exercise in session to intentionally raise your heart rate to make you uncomfortable. You might breathe through a straw to get that sort of air hunger, can't get a deep enough breath feeling. Maybe you'll spin around in the office chair, not like you're on an amusement park ride, but enough to intentionally feel dizzy, which is supposed to make you uncomfortable. Interoceptive exposures are clearly scary because they're going to make you feel the specific sensations that you don't want to feel, and they do require some courage and what I would like to call an informed leap of faith, but they really can be very effective in learning that your body is not broken and it's not betraying you. It's working just fine, even though the way it's working is scaring you. That's a core lesson that we learn when we do exposures, whether they are general exposures or interoceptives, and work through those sensations instead of running from them or saving yourself from them, right? But this is really difficult. Because 
exposures are artificial. We manufacture them to find ways to intentionally trigger you. They don't often look like your life would look. They're a little bit clinical. They could be sort of sterile and they can have no meaning. And they're also really like bright, light, cold, nothing warm and fuzzy about them. Oh, I'm going to get up right now and intentionally trigger myself for no other reason than to trigger myself. So that's a difficult way to go about it, but it is effective. So let's look at a second way to sort of rebuild body trust, which might be through the use of exercise. Now, I am not talking about going from the sofa to a marathon in two weeks or going from zero exercise to daily CrossFit sessions or running Spartan races. Like you don't have to do that. You don't have to become a bodybuilder or a powerlifter in two weeks. That's not a thing. But we all hear that exercise is good for anxiety, air quotes, for a reason. And forget all the theories about burning off adrenaline and cortisol. Let's forget about that part. Let's just look at the psychological impacts. Exercise that you enjoy, whatever that may be, it can look any way you want, is doing something good for you just because you want to and it benefits you. Like that alone is huge for an anxious person that would otherwise sit idle, scanning and actively worrying and ruminating all day long. That's a huge step forward. I'm going to do something good for myself. And it's an activity that I relate to in some way, shape or form. I like to run. I like to walk. I like to do calisthenics. I don't know whatever it is. But can you see the difference? It's a little bit more life oriented as opposed to like clinical exposures that often don't have any relation to life at all. Now exercise is also a great stress management tool, right? So down the road, the benefits of, you know, helping empty the stress jug to borrow Josh Fletcher's analogy from the work we do over on disordered, which is the podcast we do together at disorder.fm. Check it out. So exercise is a great stress management tool. And exercise does have physical benefits. And there is literally never a time to not be healthy, right? Like there's nothing wrong with wanting to be healthy. So exercise can even have social benefits if you're using group activities that give you a reason to move your body sort of in that context. But for today, we have to acknowledge that exercise can often be triggering before it is beneficial. That's true, which is exactly why we are including it today. You might find that exercise is really difficult because again, it triggers the sensations that you fear so much that you don't trust your body anymore. So you don't really want to do things that push it or what you think is pushing it in any way. So we have to acknowledge that before you get the benefits of exercise, you've got to work through its often triggering nature. We got to put that on the table. Otherwise, people start to feel confused and a little bit let down. But engaging in exercise is like doing interoceptive exposures with your therapist. But you get to pick what you do just because you want to do it. And it's broader in scope than just limited body focus specific activities in the therapist's office, right? Or in your kitchen, for instance, if you do interoceptive homework. So like a walk around your neighborhood for five minutes counts as does maybe just even walking around your garden or choosing to take the trash out yourself rather than asking one of your kids to do it. I would ask my kids to do it anyway. We can experiment with purposeful exercise, the use of our bodies to learn that we don't have to treat our own hearts or muscles or joints or lungs or eyes or bones as threats or things that are fragile and apt to break. And a third way to approach this would be to use things like yoga, or even maybe a gentle form of martial arts like Tai Chi. I mean, when you see people practicing Tai Chi, it actually looks really quite beautiful. But anyway, I claim zero expertise in either as I am a real beginner when it comes to yoga. And I know almost nothing about Tai Chi other than when I tried to technicify it to stop my anxiety many, many years ago. But there is a reason why yoga, for instance, is included as part of, say, mindfulness based stress reduction, which is a hugely like evidence supported intervention for stress reduction and working on things just like this. So intentionally making time to do things like gently stretching, balancing and using your muscles, but in a non judgmental non striving way is at least for my money, an excellent way to start to rebuild trust and faith in your physical being and your physicality. And it just dawned on me that I'm talking about yoga. So I guess I'm now officially holistic. Look at me. But seriously, though, if breathing through a straw in your therapist's office sounds terrifying, and even a walk around the block sounds like too much in the way of exercise, then gentle yoga or say Tai Chi practice within your medical limits. Remember, we're always assuming that you've been checked out. If you have injuries or stuff, you may have to work around that. But those things are designed to re explore your body and what it could do. And I think that's a darn good idea. 
as we go down the road, I'm going to be talking more about this kind of thing and about things like MBSR, mindfulness based stress reduction, as I start to integrate them more fully into my practice, both personally and professionally. But remember, you don't have to squat 600 pounds, run a six minute mile or hike, you know, the Appalachian Trail to regain trust in your body. Even starting with basic movements a few minutes a day also counts. So like, don't overlook yoga. For a lot of times, I would have overlooked stuff like that, but I won't anymore. I'll be in integrating it into the work that I do with my therapy clients, for sure. Because it has benefit, and it can help you learn to trust your body again. So let's look at what all of these things have in common. The first thing is always the bad news that we have to acknowledge because we deal in reality here on The Anxious Truth. All of these things are going to feel scary or impossible at some level. This is what we expect. You fear and do not trust your body. That's why you're listening for 20 minutes to this crazy podcast episode. The fear that you have about your body and the lack of trust will insist that the sofa or the bed is a much more responsible, safer choice. We choose to do movement anyway, in a variety of ways that I've just described to face this fear so that we can learn from the experiences. The second thing they have in common they show you through experience that your body is still capable. Now, it's true, maybe not as capable as it was before, probably because you've been sedentary and out of practice for a while, but still capable. And once we start to see this capability again, then you're on the road to rebuilding some new version of old you from a physical standpoint. Now, maybe you can't run like you once did five years ago or lift like you did five years ago. But that doesn't mean that walking your dog for five minutes has to be avoided like the plague at all costs. Third thing that they share in common, these things, whether they are exposures slash interoceptive exposures, intentional exercise in a more traditional sense, or gentle things like yoga or Tai Chi, these are all ways to open yourself up to different options. Fear of your own body, not trusting your body is going to lead you into places where you get rigid. And that rigidity shows as limitations. Part of what we work on when we use things like ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy in therapy is opening up to other options. So you have to ask yourself, what would happen if you at least consider that sitting at your kitchen table all day is not the only way? Can you open yourself up to other options that might offer valuable lessons? When we engage in reestablishing body trust, like I'm talking about today, we are not only literally building physical flexibility, which I could certainly use more of myself, but we are helping to improve our psychological flexibility, which is a core part of recovery, at least in my view of this particular issue and my view of the world. And finally, especially if much of your identity or self image was connected to your physicality, maybe you were an athlete of some kind or an outdoors person, engaging exposures, interoceptive exposures, purposeful exercise in the more traditional sense or gentle yoga, or all ways to reconnect to things that you value. These are things that matter to you. Talk about values all the time. Because if we are working on ways to move from fear based living to values based living as part of how we define recovery, then choosing to rebuild trust in your body using these methods sort of from scariest to gentlest is likely going to be an essential element in that plan. So what we have here is an acknowledgement that like anxious people do begin to fear their own bodies very often, they do lose trust in their bodies, and then they wind up being sedentary, living a very limited lifestyle because of it, hating that feeling depressed. But there are ways, unfortunately, they involve doing and experience not just thinking and talking, there are ways of on, along a spectrum from sort of clinical and super scary down to maybe softer and a little gentler and easy to engage in to start to rebuild the trust in your own body to see that, oh, it's not broken. It's not as fragile as I think it is. If we give them a look and open up to those options, we give ourselves at least some chance to start to get back to where we once were or want to be again from a physical standpoint. And if you're going to work on the physical stuff, then like it or not, accidentally, you're working on the mental, emotional, psychological stuff at the same time. So win, 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 win all around, even though this sometimes is stuff that's hard to do. It's scary, it takes that leap of faith. And you have to kind of do it before you even believe that it's going to work, which is always a hard sell. But that's what we got around here. And that is 24 minutes into it episode 30 what 304 the anxious truth in the books, you know, it's over because 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got music playing. So I will remind you before signing off, as I always do, that anything you can do to start to take some of these tips or advice or whatever you want to call it and implement it in your own life and move a little bit more toward recovery and toward your values and what matters to you and away from just reacting in fear to everything you think or feel, it counts. It doesn't matter how tiny these steps are. I would encourage you to take the tiny steps. They will add up. You will get there. And of course, if you are listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any place where they let you rate and review and you like the podcast and leave a five star rating because that really helps me out or maybe take a minute and write a review because that helps other people out because then they find the podcast and they get some help too. Of course, if you're on YouTube and you dig it, like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when I upload new stuff. And I don't know, leave a comment if you want. If you're listening as a podcast episode, follow the link in the podcast description. You can send in questions via text promise I'm going to circle back around and try and answer as many of this stuff as possible. And that's it. I guess I'll be back in two weeks as I always am with another topic. I'm not quite sure what that's going to be, but I will be here. Thanks for hanging out today. I hope you found it useful or helpful in some way. And I will be back next time. Thanks a bunch, guys. We are out.